Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Engaging the Phenomenon. And today we have our good friend and special guest, Richard Dolan. Welcome, Richard. Hi, James. It's always a pleasure. Love being yeah. on here with you. So everybody Do people know how long we've known each other. I don't think so. I don't think so, because I'm just going to say I first ran into you more than 10 years ago on my Facebook page with regularity back when I did that. You were, by the way, a lot younger looking. You had a big mop of hair. You're a young guy in his 20s. But I remember thinking this is a smart guy who is a good guy and we got to keep him. I remember thinking that explicitly a long, long time. And now here you are. You're just like, you're doing it all. You've got an amazing channel. And I'm always happy to be on here as your guest. I love it. I appreciate that. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, having messages and discussions with you back then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I yeah. I, uh, like when AD came out, I got the like pre-ordered first edition signed copy of the original. And uh, yeah, when uh, UFOs in the 21st century launched, that was like a big thing, too. And I, I yeah, I think yeah. I was in like a, one of those like promo clips holding up the book. You were. Yeah. Dude, that was that was great. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah, because I a young man. <laughs> yeah. I because I think a lot of my audience, they probably didn't come across me until like post the, the after the December 2017 thing, right? Because right. I was around, yeah, sure. but I, I, I didn't have my channel and everything, but I was you yeah. know still talking to researchers and whatnot. Um, yeah, I knew you back in 20, like 2010, 2011, I'm thinking. It's yeah, it going was, way back. Yeah. It was about Long 2010. Time. Yeah. Long That's time. almost 15 years. It is. <laughs> so yeah. I just, I'd like people to know that uh, you've been doing this a long time. And I just, um, I'm so glad, honestly, that you are still in this field and uh, in this community doing all of the great work you do. So it's oh, wonderful. Thanks a lot, Richard. I appreciate yeah. that. And, um, you know, so apparently, you know, or obviously, right, for us, like looking back then and now we're in a different world, aren't we? We, yes, um, yes, it's very different. I mean, we were doing a little pre-interview chat here, and you were just mentioning that the people who just jumped into UAP or UFOs after 2017, and it's true, like there's like a very different kind of uh, understanding of the phenomenon compared with those of us who've been working this field for such a long time, and that's normal. But uh, we, yeah, we're in a very different, a very different world now. I still feel that despite all of the progress that's happened culturally and the fact that we're able to have much more open conversations about this subject, UFOs, UAP, I still feel we're at the kindergarten level. I still feel like as a society, we're taking baby steps. There's a long, long way to go for us to, you know, there's a lot of truths that still need to be examined and we're not there yet. And uh, I remain hopeful that we'll get there, but we have a long way to go. Yeah. And, you know, for, for some of those considerations, right. Some of the, the truths are, um, you know, some of what you're referring to, can you list off just quickly a few, a few things that you think are not at yeah. the forefront of the conversation right now, Yes, but you know, again, when, 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 like we were talking about before, there's a, almost an oversaturation of UFO news now when, you know, back in the day, even 10 years ago, right. There was way more research going on because there was less to do than, than cycle than, than recycle the news that's going on and talk about current events. Cause there were no current events, <laughs> you know, other than like a weird story. You had the O'Hare thing, the Stevensville case, occasional you know, sightings like that. that were big. Yeah. 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 But no, you're right. It was much, much less. The news, uh, especially the mainstream news, just wasn't covering this almost at all, like almost completely at all. So it was very different. I would say what we're missing is a willingness to recognize that non-human intelligences are actually operating on this planet of ours. We're still at this stage of we're able to push it away psychologically and and still ask, is this real? Are they here? Is it China? Is it Russia? Is it aliens? Like you've got this um, complete unwillingness, of course, by the establishment voices to just make the basic recognition that, no, it's not the Russians. Let's not be stupid here. It's not the Chinese. It's, it's not 
This is not all black budget either. There is an intelligence that is operating on this planet that is of incredibly advanced capability, that has a very sophisticated and entrenched infrastructure right now. And they have got goals. They have got objectives. They're doing things. I'm not saying that those goals are necessarily all evil or bad. I don't know. But they've got goals. They're here. There's there's intention going on. And it is widespread. It is global. And I just don't hear, forget the mainstream culture. I don't really hear, hear even uh, UFO researchers getting into these questions like, what are they doing? Why are they here? What uh, we're, we are primed right now at the most monumental transformation um, of the of human beings in all of our history, maybe since the discovery of fire. You know, we're moving into very strong AI, very strong computing capabilities and all everything else that we all know, like we're transforming into a totally new civilization, all in the matter of a generation or two, which is really fast. That's happening at the same time we are starting to come to a recognition that there are these other humans here. In other words, as we move into a transhuman future, we are now starting to have the baby steps of a conversation that there are non-humans that are already operating here. Doesn't that seem like these kind of things we want to see? Is there a relationship there? We, we're we're seeing a massive presence of a non-human intelligence that is here at at the time that we're going through this transition, and um, you know for that reason I I have been feeling it's extremely important for us to take a good cold hard look at as accurately as we are able to of the true long history of this phenomenon. This has been kind of a mini obsession of mine over the last five plus years. Um, I, I think it started out when I started to ask myself about uh, like ancient the ancient aliens question, because I've been on that show many times and you know we take it as a given. Oh, well, they've been here forever. How many times do you hear this? Oh, the aliens have been here forever. They've always been here. They've always been here. That's really a lazy expression, in my opinion, to say that, just to, to pass it off like they've always been here. Have they? Well, who's the they that we're talking about? And have they been here? Have the greys been here forever? Don't think so. Then who are we talking about? Uh, have the motivations been the same throughout all of human history? Has the number of visiting beings been here at the same level all throughout our history? I think the answer to that is no. I think when I because I really wanted to take a fresh look at the deep history of this phenomenon. That means the ancient sightings and the um, the archaeological record and uh, you know all of that. I wanted to take a fresh look at it. So my conclusion is that yes, there is an ancient presence. I think that there are enough anomalies in our ancient past that make me think, yeah, um, I think we've been subject to long term process of some sort. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how deep it is. But I also believe that that long-term process has been kind of in the background. This is my take on it uh, in terms of quantity and in terms of, well, we'll leave the quantity first. I think there's been less than there are. And I think in the 19th century and then again in the 1940s, the 20th century, I think we saw evidence in the data of a jump in the activity of these other beings. That could be new beings coming to earth or that could be the ramping up of a previously existing society, I don't know. But I, I think that there have been definite changes in their presence. So that, you know, here we are today, there are literally thousands of good sightings not not just like you know the the ones that can easily be explained away but in my view we're talking thousands of genuinely legit sightings of ufo's uap every year around the world it's very widespread was that the case in ancient times i'm thinking i don't think so i don't think it was that hot and heavy in ancient times i think much more limited i could be wrong 
not all societies weren't that literate. They weren't leaving records. It's easy for things to get lost in the shuffle. I will admit that. But from what the way it looks to me right now is that there's been a jump in the 20th century. And all of that makes sense. I think there's been a jump in the 20th century because of because of our capabilities as a society. I mean, we are totally unlike where what we were like even 100 years ago, let alone 1,000 or 10,000 years ago. We're not we're not the same. Our capabilities are vastly different. We've un we've discovered science. We've unlocked we're unlocking the keys to the universe with we're un we're un unlocking the universe with the key of science. And that's all new. So I think that's why they're here in larger numbers. I think they're interested in us. And if I were them, I would probably know uh, these humans, okay, they're not going to be quite at our level, but they're actually going to develop very, very substantial capabilities and power. So what do we want? What's our attitude about that? Do we want to guide them? Do we want to undermine them? Do we want to, do we want to oppose them? Do we want to take them over covertly and run them the way we know it should be run? All of these are legitimate questions to ask. And I, I think that that is a scenario that's actually happening right now. And this is something that's just never being discussed. I know this is very speculative. I I recognize that. But I do think like we have got to be unafraid to speculate a bit based on the facts that we know that exist. But yes, let us ask some some hard questions. Even if we can't necessarily answer them right away, we can start to ask them and I do think that there are some answers out there. And I do think some of those answers are locked away in, yes, the national security apparatus of nations like the U.S. and uh, very likely other groups. So we have a right to know that as human beings living in this universe uh, as part of a cosmic community. Yes, we have a right to know these things. And I think that's what we need to be fighting for. We, we have to get this information because this what's happening right now in our society is very, very important. And it gets, um, you know, very little, very little genuine analysis and attention the way it deserves. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, part of what you're talking about, I think there's almost like a cognitive dissonance. Um, and I don't think that this is like even uh, conscious, so to speak. I think that you know, people not, at, you know, a lot of people have, you know, had the, the UFO conversation now credible under UAP. And so they're going with the new information and talking more about that because it's credible, right? It's less uh, stigmatized. Yeah. But the, a lot of the older research is is still has like an unconscious uh, stigma associated with it with like okay it was discredited back then so let's not bring that up but let's yeah. talk about this because it's it's making the headlines and this I is think, acceptable right. it's almost mm -hmm. like a conditioning thing right not even i think i don't know if it's intentional or not right that's we can debate that um but i, I think you know that's kind of part of what is going on like oh not you know all that ufo um, literature stuff a lot of people don't want to get into that because it's really murky um whereas like you can talk about uap now if you talk about it within the context of the current conversation if you uh if you erase the history i do think there was a big decision i remember chatting with uh chris mellon about this uh, a few years ago and i think his uh i think his heart is in the right place on this uh, he was one of the folks who really wanted to kind of shift the conversation to uap as far as ufo um and and it was a rebranding. I mean, I, I think absolutely they're trying to rebrand this. UFO had, has such a stigma to it to get a public conversation among members of Congress, for example, about UFOs five years ago would, was a very difficult thing to ask. There was just way too much going on there in terms of stigma. So I think a rebranding was seen as a positive thing, but one of the casualties of that rebranding has been the history the long, long, long history, because what uh, what we see is that the red line that must not be crossed even now is the is the the line that implicates the government in a genuine conspiracy and cover up. They they can't 
allow that to happen because that that implicates them in genuine wrongdoing and lies. So uh, in a time where, as I've been saying this for over and over, but I, it's true, in a time where no one is supposed to believe in conspiracy theories anymore, those are considered wrong, <laughs> all of them, uh, it, it really wouldn't do for the United States government to say, don't believe in those other conspiracies. Well, the, the UFO one, yeah, that's okay, but none of, none of the others. It's like, yeah, just believe in the largest one of all time, the UFO conspiracy, and no others. I mean, that's just not a good place for them to be. So the red line is the line of conspiracy. And that means the history has to be erased. Because what what it means is the, the government has to be able to have the luxury of saying, yeah, there does appear to be things out there. We actually were, we ignored it for a while. We were probably wrong to do so, but there does seem to be things out there that we can't explain. Let's look into it. We'll get back to you. And that's perfect for them. The thing they can't do Credibly is say, uh, yeah, actually, uh, Roswell happened. We took the bodies, we took the technology, we've been studying it for 80 years. We've made all like they, they can't, aside from any other crash retrievals that have happened, which there have been others, obviously. That's a bad place for them to be because when you acknowledge it, you've recovered craft and bodies. You can no longer pretend that you're going to study this and figure it out and get back to people. You can't, that's not credible because you've been implicated in something much, much greater. So the conspiracy angle of UFOs is absolutely forbidden. And as a result, I think the history has to go. They they have to get rid of the history because if you get into the history of UFOs, you're going to conclude without a shadow of a doubt that there's been a cover-up, there's been a conspiracy about UFOs. It's an unavoidable conclusion if you delve into the history. Well, so and it's, I think it's a political. It's it's now. D did Mellon? I'm sorry to cut you off. Did did Mellon and the TTSA crowd do that intentionally? I don't think so. I think they might have seen it as a necessary casualty for them to move the issue forward in the public domain. That I can see, but I think there are other interests within the national security apparatus that are very happy to see that history go away. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, credit, credit words do their, their strategy behind that. It has been so far successful. Um, and I, you know, I do know that, you know, some of those individuals are not, you know, intentionally trying to make that disappear because they, they do have the, the, the crash retrieval conversation front and center. That's something that they've only pushed harder for as, as time has gone on um, that's true because you know you know again first you know they were saying oh maybe russia maybe china even in the mainstream now that conversation is much less apparent than it was when it when, when they were first putting it out there mm -hmm. and have progressively uh moved the conversation towards non-human intelligence i mean we see that with the new Schum schumer NDAA, where they mentioned non-human intelligence like 22 times, uh, which is telling. And they even go as far to define it within their terms, right? Non-human intelligence, uh, sure. NHI. We have Grush. Um, I don't think that's going to go anywhere, by the way. that's We can get into that later. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't I, have I, I would. I would like to address that. Um, yeah. uh, anyway, keep going. And I'll, I'll just mention quickly, and we'll circle right back to that, is, you know, we have Grush basically stating uh you know what he was able to gather from interviewing over 40 witnesses some people that work directly on crash retrieval programs um and 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 uh, reverse engineering programs or you know uh, ufo exploitation programs uh he mentioned a uh, a uh, uh, a broad disinformation campaign uh, and he talked about individuals that have been, you know, harmed, injured, and and possibly murdered to maintain the secrecy around uh, the UFO cover up. So you know, you have these uh, polarities glaring us in the face. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, for That's true. yeah, and you know, when I've spoken to people like Hal or or Lou and saying, you know, how how far where where are you going to stop, right? Because you know, this is, it's okay. Like 
for what us, do you mean, where are you going to stop? I'm curious. Like, okay. Where is this conversation going to stop? Right. Are, are we going to stop at uh, crash yeah. retrievals? Are we going to stop at bodies? Like where, how far are you? Yeah, so right. bo- both of them each, you know, and, and other people I've asked, it was funny. They had a unison response word for word is we're going to go all the way. So. And I don't, both, I, by the way, it's obvious. Both of those men, they know full well there's technology and there's bodies they both yeah. know this and 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 everyone around them also knows this yeah I, Wh- whether they say it, this explicitly in public or not right that is the fact yeah yeah and you know there's private conversations about those kind of things and you know what whatever they can address publicly is a different thing but i was having a conversation even a year ago right uh, maybe even it was more than a year ago now about everything we're seeing happen today there, you know, um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to say it was necessarily them or who, or whoever else it was, but people that have been working this behind the scenes and saying, they're saying basically, yeah, we're going to bring the crash retrieval thing out. And at that time I was like, are, are we going to be talking about bodies and not act, the actual entities and non-human intelligence? And even a year ago, they were saying, you know, we don't quite know yet, you know, like uh, the priority is the technology because it's like, it's undeniable. Right. And it's like the entry level and we're going to kind of see how the public takes it and where we can actually go starting with that. And it, and that was me a little over a year ago. So now what we're seeing with Grush and that he, he clearly crossed that line. Right. I'm not saying what we're going to get traction on, but he, clearly he's going like um you know balls to the wall right if i can say that uh no that's about right right. yeah basically i mean he's 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 going all at it right he's he's not holding any he's saying there's bodies he's saying there's a serious conspiracy he's saying there's massive government illegality and in fact deeply criminal activity in terms of harming individuals to keep this secret so yeah he's he's put all of these out there do you think um, I'm going to ask you this question because I think, I mean, I think I have my opinion on this, that a lot of the motivation for pushing this, let's let's call it this kind of disclosure effort, um, is financial, especially from certain uh, corporate interests that want to have access to this technology and, and may not have access to it. Do you think? Because this is what I, this is what I think. I believe that there's, and I I don't know this for a fact regarding TTSA, by the way, but I I suspect that they and people maybe near them they've known full well that there's cover up of UFO tech. They've known this for years, and they've known that some corporations have access to that tech, but they don't. So it's an unfair, it's an unlevel playing field. And I believe, and this is just a hypothesis, that the one of the biggest motivations for pushing this out is to give access to the technology and therefore money making opportunities to some of these groups. That's what I. That's what I just I, I suspect. Do you have an opinion on that? I think that's. I don't. I, I wouldn't say maybe that's the. I mean, that's probably a partial thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of it, right? I don't think that's the entirety of it. But I, I do think that's part of it. Um, but, you know, because I think uh, it was awesome. So, you know, Hal, Hal Putoff gave that presentation, uh, maybe it was 2018 or 2019, about OSAP. And, and the metamaterial, he talked about that. Right. In the same yeah. Lecture. So yeah, that but, was for the S, uh, SSC conference, which was, that was an important lecture. Yeah. And so during that lecture, one of the main uh, threat assessments of OSAP was not that we're going to be invaded and and some uh, you know by UFOs, right? The the major threat concern was that another uh, you know rival country or you know was going to possibly develop this technology faster than us, and that that is right. what the threat you know the major th- immediate threat concern was that they saw. Mm-hmm is that they would have uh, a program, a UFO program that's less siloed, less compartmentalized uh, in the sense and that- And they can move faster at making breakthroughs. 
exactly. Yeah. It's a, that's a legitimate concern without a doubt. And particularly looking at the Russians who have uh, a definite history of their own crash retrievals that go back a long time. China is not as, it's not as obvious that they have uh, the same history of crash retrievals. It's been speculated that they may have acquired some of this as well, but they're, the, the data is just not secure. Whereas with Russia, we're very confident in saying that they have definitely acquired some of their own tech. And they've got very smart scientists over there. They've easily had the capability of making breakthroughs. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the thing is, there's there's all, if you listen to the Philip Corso story and all the kind of um, different technologies that may have been influenced or augmented you know, due to the retrieval of uh, UFOs, right? UFO technology, mm. you know, George Knapp has, has talked about that when he was over there that he spoke to, uh, I, I think a Russian general or something that was saying they had a, a kind of laser weapon that they derived from UFO technology. And they were saying if they could perfect it, you know, they could, they could really, you know, do damage to us. Right. Um, and there's, Again, By the way, China has just perfected a laser weapon. I don't know if you heard about that. Yeah, and I know you know we uh, U.S. Yeah. has had directed energy weapons and and things like that. I we I think we keep a lot of that very hidden and guarded and confused on you know intentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I think the the reason that you know the concern for China is because they're quickly building an infrastructure that could you know facilitate that kind of R and D maybe. Oh yeah, there's no question. You know, so if they They've somehow the acquired it, you know, maybe from another, even from another country, if they acquired it somehow, maybe not directly a crash within China, but anywhere in that you know area. Oh well, look, China and Russia are essentially symbiotic allies at this point. Right. I mean, that's, that's really U.S. That's, strategy drove them together. By the way, but they are incredibly close now. And I mean, I don't know that the Russians would be sharing UFO tech with the Chinese, but I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a concern, right? It's yeah. a concern. So I, I think um, part of what we're seeing with disclosure, yeah, is to get more bright minds. I mean, what should have been from the beginning, but you have uh, more scientists working on this because – that that's something we can, we can't afford to uh to lose control of right i don't want to say control right like a dod controlling it or whoever right um elements elements within uh but that's um that is a genuine concern uh but i you know getting into this you know we were talking before about uh factions right mm. uh there there seem to be factions some that are are for transparency on this issue, um, some that are completely against it, and some who are kind of like midway, like, well, you know, the general public should know um, that UFOs exist and there's non-human intelligence, uh, but they want to stop there. And uh, so you have all these different. Um, right. Yeah. So I think it's important to talk about this because. Uh... As we all know, and I'm sure many people watching uh, are aware, there have been claims for the past six years now, since 2017, basically, that every single thing that's come out basically is is part of an op, disinformation op, CIA stage managed. Uh, I still hear people talking about like Project Blue Beam type things, you know, false flag alien invasion, and all all of this has just got lies. From the government, and I, I have I have very strongly mixed feelings when I hear that because, yes, we know that our governments, U.S. and other governments, lie. They lie all the time. That's absolutely true. So we have to keep that in mind. But you also have to keep in mind the fact that throughout all of human history, I don't think there's been an exception. When you look at ruling elites in societies. You're always going to find factional disputes. It is, it's the rule. It's not the exception. It is absolutely the rule. So um, whether it's ancient Rome or 
uh, medieval Europe or or Chinese history or the Indian subcontinent. Like there's always factions that are competing with each other. They all want power against each other. They all have different ideas about how that society should be governed or what directions it should go. This is an old story. And we know when you look at the history of the UFO cover-up, read, people should read some of the old books by people like Donald Kehoe. You know, Kehoe is the true OG of UFO research. He is the guy. He was a badass, by the way. Former Marine Corps major, uh, a friend of uh, Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Kehoe, buddies with him. Kehoe was an Annapolis classmate of the first director of the CIA, Roscoe Helen Cotter. Kehoe uh, got into the UFO subject uh, around 1950 and just never let go, and it never let go of him. And he wrote brave books. The guy was courageous. He talked to people at the highest level. He did all of that. And and what, what did he say? He said, look, there is a factional war. Back in the 50s and the 1960s, when he was super active in this, he said, there's the secrecy group. That's what he called them. That was his name for them. The people who believed this secret must never, ever, ever come out. And then he said, but there are always people within the military, within the national security structure, who did not agree with that, who had other opinions. Some of them were admirals and generals. Some of them were ranking intelligence officers. Like they were, they were smart people and they had a different attitude. They believed that this, they seemed idealistic. Maybe they were. They believed that this secret needed to come out. There's always been such people who don't like to be treated like, you know, don't have to lie. They don't want to have to lie to the public all the time. There are always people like that. So there's always been a factional dispute going way back with the UFOs. And of course, that mirrors everything else that we know about history. There's factional disputes between the Navy and the Air Force back in olden days with this. And why should that be surprising? They're different services. They're both proud of their history. Navy, especially, they go way back. They didn't like to play second fiddle to the Air Force with the UFO cover-up. They had their own attitude. You see all of this going in the history of the UFO cover-up. Why should we think it is any different today? Are we somehow, did we morph into a different species? No, we're the same. So yes, there are always disputes. And I firmly believe, and the longer I look into this, the more I study this, the more I I feel very confident in saying we're looking at a similar factional war right now. There is the continuation of the old secrecy group, as Kehoe described it way back then. They still exist. They're still very powerful. But does anyone actually think that uh, there would never rise against it another faction of individuals who have different opinions? Like, never? And these other people, let's call them the TTSA people, folks around Robert Bigelow, a lot of them coalesced around the old um, National Institute for Discovery Science, NIDS, you know. Um, a lot of them are in Jacques Vallée's Forbidden Science, Volumes 4 and 5. You know, I mean, you know who the, the crowd is. And they, they've all, many of them have high-level security clearances. Most of them have some level of clearances, some of them very, very high. They don't all have the same opinions, but there's a kind of general consensus that they have had for years, which is that we need to have more of an open public conversation on this. We need to have some truth out. And I think that's what we're looking at. That's essentially what TTSA was. TTSA wasn't formed. Uh, it doesn't mean that the intelligence community didn't want to get their hooks into it and help manipulate it. I have no doubt that's true. But you've got a group of people in there who have their own opinions. And they do believe in getting some of this information out. So that's what we're seeing. So it is a factional war, and that has now made its way to the halls of Congress in the last congressional hearing. You know, none of this would be happening if if a TTSA had not formed back in 2017. I, I think none of what we're seeing would have come out. They were the spark that allowed the New York Times to publish those two articles in 2017 and Politico back then. And all of the repercussions that have happened since then was because of that group. 
that everyone loves to malign, make fun of, or trash talk. Uh, but they are the ones that started it. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that, like, they've said everything that they know. Uh, they, they've held, they've held things back. But, but they are evidence of a factional dispute, and um, and it's still not clear how that dispute will end up. Many years ago, when TTSA was still going full guns, I made a prediction, which turned out to be true. Unfortunately, I said, you know, people are loving to take this group down. Well, I think they're probably not going to last much longer. And, you know, they're basically a done deal. They don't exist anymore, really. So, um, and the whole disclosure movement, if we can call it that, of last few years, there's been some serious progress that's been made, but it's not, it is not absolutely certain that we're going to maintain all the gains that we've had in terms of a public conversation on this. It could regress. It could absolutely regress. We're we're living in an era now where media control is becoming in danger, of becoming so comprehensive that is it really? And, and you know, we have certainly AI algorithms increasingly are going to probably be monitoring like news and information that reaches us. We have to assume that. Is it really difficult to think? that in another year or two, we're going to be seeing a closing of the door. And you know, we talked about the Schumer bill, or I, I mentioned, I said, I don't really know if that's going to have much of an impact. Uh, for people who don't know, Chuck Schumer, Senator from New York, is in, is, is inserting into the new NDAA a provision, uh, a couple of things about it. It's very interesting. And as you're right, he's mentioned non-human intelligences in the language multiple times. It's fascinating. But the main provisions are uh, one is to give uh, private contractors a certain limited window of time in which to let the rest of the world know that they've got exotic technology that they've been studying, non-human tech, essentially. That's a big ask, by the way. And uh, what was the other? Oh, yeah, the other was uh, basically allowing records to be uh, released and declassified relating to UAP along the lines, as they say, of the JFK Records uh, Act. Which, by the way, yeah, still is very limited. But, but that's what Schumer wants to do now. Is that going to result in what some people would like? I, I'm going to say no. I don't think it will. I don't think it's going to result in what people think. So, the what could easily happen a year from now is you can see this happening. Corporations, Lockheed, Boeing, what all Raytheon, they're going to say, "Yeah, we look, we didn't find anything." And that's going to be the end of it. Do you think people are going to be able to go into Skunk Works or whatever other secret department that may be within Lockheed Martin and say, oh, here's here's your UFO program that that a Grush and Elizondo and others have been hinting about and talking about. So they're not going to find it. And so you could easily see a narrative taking place where the major, the establishment narrative will be, well, yeah, we looked for it, it's not there. Okay. Nothing to see here. It's done. And uh, and the same with the whole records release. How, what will get released through FOIA? Will, will something major be released? Well, there may be some UFO sightings that get released. I could see that. You know, we had uh, in the early years of FOIA, freedom of information in this country, in the late 70s, there were some really fascinating military documents that were released. And they had a little bit of an impact at the time, and then they just basically got forgotten. I could easily see this happening. In other words, that toothpaste that got squeezed out of the tube over the last few years, some of it may just dry up on the table and be ignored, and some of it may get squeezed right back into that tube. And the cap gets screwed back on, and we could easily be in a place not far off from where we were before this all started. The ball may have moved a little bit farther down the field, maybe 20, 30 yards, and boom, he had a wall of defense that's just not letting it move any further. That, that's possible. So like, in other words, this is a factional war to answer your question. And this is not necessarily, we're not at the point yet where the true ruling elite says, all right, let's roll this out in a controlled way, following the old 
time-worn CYA rule <laughs> so that we don't get into trouble. That could happen. A limited controlled disclosure that's still on the table, but I don't think we're there yet. I think we're still looking at a real possibility of that lid getting slammed right back down and screwed tight. That's still a possible outcome for the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. That could still happen. Yeah. Because I, we're moving I, into an era of total, total propaganda and information control. I think that's a genuine concern. I, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Good. Know, Someone's got to be. Uh, right. <laughs> okay. um, I, th I think that. I think that there are too many people are invested in this now that that are willing to go to bat. Um, you may be right. That that's totally possible. Because it, yeah. it I mean with Grush Grush is is the spearhead, right? But there's an entire staff behind him that that spear is attached to. Mm -hmm. And they've already spoken to the Inspector General, the ICIG They've given evidence and testimony. You know, Grush gave 11 and a half hours of testimony to Congress or um, or was it the ICIG in closed door? So, you know, with with uh, locations, names, um, the, what they're working on. And, you know, I don't know how many of those 40 plus witnesses corroborated uh, what Grush's testimony was, but from the, the sense I have is that there were quite a number of them that uh, and, and some that he had not spoken to who went forward to the ICIG and and verified and corroborated his his testimony that he, he wasn't even aware of them. And uh, they were they went to the ICIG and, and also gave evidence that supported what he was saying. Um, so, I mean. If behind the scenes they they decide like whatever the limit is and I and the Schumer and the Schumer language, we at least understand that there's a seed in people's head now, right? That disclosures on the table. Uh, you know, we hear uh, yeah. you know Tim Burchett and others and and AOC and and uh, you know everybody you know some of those politicians, uh, and, and another one you know tweeted like this is disclosure, you know. So that that idea of disclosing this to the public is is something that they're seriously considering. And again, in, in the Schumer language, it says there needs to be a plan to disclose this to the public. You know, obviously, that means it's going to be managed in some way. I mean, why well, they have to they have to figure out the labyrinthian legal procedures by which any kind of UFO disclosure could happen. Like the Senate or the Cong Congress is not in a position to do it because they don't have the information. Well, maybe they have some of the information now. Well, I think maybe, that maybe they do. Maybe so they've he, got some. Right? I think even in um, you know, a number of years ago, Christopher Mellon was referring to that and and talking about the overclassification, and so I think that they that's actually something that they've been they had been working on. Okay, like okay, you know. Is it legal? Is it illegal? Is it some kind of gray area? And you know, obviously, the the legacy programs comes into it where it's it's kind of lacking oversight, but it's still legal because it falls under the National Security Act. Yeah, uh, I call it legal illegality. I can't think of any other way to describe right. it. Right. So it's, it's they make it it legal, but it's it's actually illegal. But they do it. Right. They have their fig leaf to cover them. Because it was, they 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 needed to utilize plausible deniability to run the programs, yeah. you know, and keep the the proper authorities' hands clean. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So, and and to run the secrecy, you have to do an end run around Congress anyway, because you, you can't let them in because it, it would compromise the secret. And but by its very nature, that's illegal already. When you start creating black budget programs, special access programs to manage this. You're now taking it out of the hands of the American people, which is where it's supposed to be, according to our constitution. Yeah. So they make it; it's illegal, but they have to make it legal. Yeah. So I, I, I do think that that had been a concern from the beginning. I think that people like, uh, 
with we'll just say within that Bigelow group have been working how how can you legally get this to the right people and have something something close to proper oversight you know so that you can begin to disclose it uh at least some of it i think i think the real key that allowed this to happen is melon and elizondo without the none of this happens right so they got uh they got the videos released those three videos that was all they're doing and uh and then the acknowledgement of the eight tip program i mean those those without yeah, you know, I guess the uh, recognition of the Tic Tac incident too, but I, well, that's part of the, the videos. Like, I think I think that's what allowed it. And they were able to, um, and they had friends in the media. They had Leslie uh, and Ralph, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal, who were able to go to bat and get those stories in the New York Times. It was a, that's like, that was a Herculean task and they they did it that was not an easy thing to do right and and also you know uh, you know again a lot because of you know uh a lot of thanks is owed to senator harry reed who who put off that together and you know if you want a summary of that you can look at uh, loose threads which ties the history of this <laughs> together where because you know, OSAP was trying to gain access to these programs, right? I think that's almost, you know, part of why they created OSAP. Uh, and they, they tried to get um, special access program status to OSAP, SAP status, so they could potentially um, can find other SAP programs related to UFOs. Yes, right. I think that was, that seems to have been the goal, but they and didn't succeed in that. Not at all, no. Happen. No, no, they failed. But, and, and you know, if you recall, that's when Lou kind of came along. And the interesting thing, I, I don't think people, I don't hear people talk about it much as with Lou is, you know, he was running counterintelligence, right? So he, Lou understands how to hide programs, right? So in turn with that, he knows how to find them. So I think that's a very, oh, right. Lou, very because that's his specialty, right? Security. If you understand security, you know how to circumvent it. Yeah. And he had the right access and the connections within DOD. So I think that Lou was able to find programs. That's you know this for sure. I, this is a suspicion. This is yeah, a suspicion. I think I think that's a really good bit of reasoning there. That makes sense to me. You know, and it makes sense and, that he would have been well, he would have been reasonably well qualified and positioned to maybe find other similar programs. I wouldn't be surprised that he found them because right. that man knows things. There's no question about it. That man knows very, very significant things about this. Yeah. And he's, this is he's thrown hints, hint after hint after hint after hint that he has done so. Yeah. And and again, not to to mention uh, you know, his connection to all every, you know, everybody from NIDS and OSAP and and Eric who Dr. Eric Davis, who potentially was involved with uh, some programs, I think even, you know, I wouldn't have said it publicly, but Jeremy Corbell has been saying that Eric was connected to uh, a UFO program with lasers, you know, some kind of. Yeah, I heard this. That yeah. was on weaponized. He, he discussed it. So if you want to go listen to that weaponized uh, podcast that uh, Jeremy did with George, I think it's maybe last week or the mm -hmm. week before that and they you know he he mentioned that also i think on the joe rogan when he recently did it so it's uh, out there yeah it's out there it's out there i mean everyone knows this too i mean eric davis is a brilliant scientist who has done very sophisticated work on the uap ufo subject and he he knows where the bodies are buried as it were he knows where the technology is just like just like Lou Elizondo, clearly just like David Grush. Yeah, so I guess maybe your theme here is that this information, it's it's coming out. It's kind of started out by with a trickle, and now it's like a little running brook. <laughs> it's flowing a little bit more. And um, it could it could become more significant than that. Yeah. That's really like gonna be the question, like where how far this can go. 
before we get to a true point of no return, a, but like an avalanche. Like I, 13 years ago, I wrote, I wrote a book on disclosure after disclosure. And uh, my co-author and I, uh, this was the question we wanted to know is like, how, how could a genuine disclosure really go down? And back in 2010, it was a different world. I mean, it was a very different world. It's crazy to say that. It's only 13 years ago. But it was very different. My assumption always was that with a significant UFO disclosure of some kind of the recognition of the validity of the subject, that it would likely cause an avalanche of... Like everyone would get worked up, everyone would want to know, and they would force the president or some other powerful person to make an admission. And that's what has not happened. That has not happened. We had, I think we got a lot of things very, very right, but it was not possible to predict how this was going to go down. I mean, we're not at the avalanche point. And, and this has been out now for, you know, if you want to count 2017, when this all really started. New York Times basically saying, oh, maybe the UFOs are real. <laughs> okay. That's a big moment. And uh, the avalanche has not happened. We're still, you know, the CIA and military intelligence, they they apparently have not decided to throw their cards down and walk away from the table. They're still, they're still in it. Yeah. Th so this is, uh, sorry, Rich, this is a completely random question that just came into my mind because I had not heard anybody ask it to you. Was that okay? So, like, when you're when you're writing that book, AD After Disclosure, you know, you had re you'd read a few pages of the Wilson Davis memo at that point. So, where where what were you? Was that where was that floating around in your mind? Because uh, you know, just well, very that's a great question. Um, I don't know if well, you know, it's funny. I have to really rethink this because I talked explicitly and publicly about the Thomas Wilson scenario yeah, in I remember. 2007 and 2008 and 2009. And Bryce Zabel and I wrote after disclosure in 2010. Like that was when we wrote our first edition and all through this spring and summer of 2010, we were writing that book and we published it in the autumn of that year. So Will's, the whole Eric Davis notes, like that was very much embedded in my mind. So no, that actually, um, I think that did have an effect for me. What I knew was that <laughs> there are bodies and there's technology. I had talked with Edgar Mitchell about this oh. back in those years. Now, Mitchell did not tell me about Eric Davis or any, or, Thomas Wilson. What what Mitchell had said to me is was, Apollo was he, fourteen. Was at, at that time was he publicly like, um, was it known that he was on the the science advisory board for NIDS? Was that public yeah. even then? Okay, yeah, I, th okay. I think so. Yeah, okay. I think that was publicly known. Yeah, and also Mitchell had made a few public statements right about his knowledge of of technology and bodies. Yeah, uh, he was basically ignored, and a lot of the media made him look like a, a loony old you know grandpa just put him over there, let him sit in the sunshine and give him some hot chocolate. But but he was making these statements. That's how they were treating him. Yeah. Of course, that's not how he was. Mitchell was very, very astute right up to the end. But um, anyway, yeah, so I'm trying to think back here. So I, I knew I'd spoken with Edgar Mitchell. I'd spoken with a few other people. I'll just leave it at that. I knew that that was all real. And I'd known it anyway from my own research. Like I knew that there were crash retrievals. I knew that there were bodies. I'd studied Stringfield by then inside and out. I I didn't need to be persuaded. So that all did absolutely factor into my thought about how disclosure would go down. And for me, it was maybe a big sighting would happen, maybe a big leak of some sort that could not be denied and that would force the government to make a statement that it's real. And then my assumption always was, well, people then will know if this is real. Crash retrievals are almost certainly real. Uh, all those rumors, are we just going to ignore that? We know that stuff is real. And all the other uh, rumors and lore and leaks 
would all be open for questioning. And then that would lead to a kind of avalanche, as it were, of crash retrieval data coming out and then information about bodies. And then the whole thing's just going to go blow right open. It would be impossible for the establishment to contain it. That was the kind of the scenario that I envisioned. And Bryce, I think we I think we were on the same page with that. I think we both saw that as going down the same way. And that is what did not happen. That's what did not happen. We had something totally different. Yeah. And and I'll just say this. It didn't happen in part because it was no longer 2010. If it had happened in 2010, I think there's a damn good chance. Right. It might have gone down the way we thought, as in an avalanche. But but six, seven years later, the world had gone through a revolution in social media control, in internet control, in um, the ability by what we can call the establishment to control that narrative. I think they'd become very, very good at it by even 2015, 2016, and then 2017. So I think we underestimated the ability of the establishment to uh, control this subject. Maybe that, maybe we did that. So, uh, so what we're seeing now is a faction puts some information out there, and but the established secrecy group says, "No, we're, we're we can fight this. Then you made a pretty good move. We've got our plan. We can we can." parry this this attempt by you and they have done that they've been very successful and they have their allies of course in the major media in fact most of the major media is still on board with them right you, you look at the coverage on this it's still most of it's a lot of it's totally dismissive i'm not saying all those guys are working for the national security state but and that's not how it works you you get in your position because the people above you like what you have to say and they'll they'll let you say that so, um, so I think you know there's a much stronger resilience by the established the secrecy group than maybe Bryce and I had envisioned when we wrote that book 13 years ago. Yeah, I mean, even me back like my mind where my mind was at back then, and kind of like the uh, you know reading the room, so to speak. Yeah, that if half of what ha has happened now happened happened back then, it would have been a huge deal. But it seems yes, absolutely. people are so distracted and overwhelmed these days that I, it's like it's. Yeah. I think people people are so numb to to the cover up to the information that like they've been inoculated, and it's like it doesn't even phase them. Right? There's been a congressional hearing were a whistleblower of the highest degree with the most amazing credentials um, where you would expect somebody to have access to this kind of information would be perfectly set telling you that he's spoken to over 40 plus people and has, has, you know, come to the conclusion and was shown evidence that he provided to the ICIG yeah. of crash retrievals, uh, disinformation against the American public regarding UFOs to maintain secrecy, bodies of uh, non-human biologics, right? We can assume that's non-human entities of some sort. In an earlier generation, that would be freaking nuclear. Yeah, half of that it would be, be. That would be half nuclear. Half of it would be. So and you're right. Like it, and it had had some of an impact, but really, how much? Talk to your neighbors. How many of them really are even on top of this at all? I have to say, with each iteration of of these waves that we've had, mm -hmm. more people that I know, even even in my public circle that are not into this, heard about it, and mm -hmm. you know, like there there is there is a, a, a you know a, a sea change, right? There is there is a tide moving here, uh, lifting. So, but it's so it's gradual. Whereas, like again, ten years ago, I, this would have just like you feel like the the world would have changed in a day, right? Yeah, yeah. Overnight. If, if Grush, totally, if Grush had done his testimony in 2010, let alone 2000 or 1990 or, oh my God, it would have been, I think, a vastly greater impact than it, than it did today. I, it seems to me, I think so. 
you know, and uh, yeah. so, and, you know, we talk about the, um, the idea of an operation, right? Like a psyop, right. But, you know, to, to what extent of it coming out the, the way it did, and I, I, I'm not giving omnipotence to this. You're going to see where I'm going here of the, the influence of non-human intelligence having an influence on how we, even we ourselves are disclosing it to some extent, right? Our exposure to it, you know, or to what extent that some of it was instigated, right? I mean, what I mean by that is like all these incidents that are, we're talking about now, they're saying there's like hundreds of incidents a year, at least with the, the Navy. Uh, is that as part of that an instigation or, or, or are we just capturing more because of the, our technology is greater? By instigation, you mean is is part of it just them, these other beings that are very active? Is that what you're asking? I mean, are they, you know, intentionally interfering with us more in order for us to more publicly accept them? No, I I don't think so. I think they've been interfering with us for quite some time. Yeah. You go back to the 1940s and 50s and 60s, you can find countless military engagements of these objects almost nonstop. And that, not just the United States, but NATO countries, Soviet Union, this has been, as far as I can see, a global military issue for a long time, since the 1940s, when it really became a, a fundamentally military problem. So is it more now than before? That I can't tell. It's hard to know, because it's hard really to have accurate data to, to know, like, is it more now than than it's not clear to me, but um, but you you raised an interesting question, which is I don't know if you meant to do this or not, but have they? To what extent are they influencing our society? Right, I think you were kind of asking. Uh, this is something that I I've become more and more interested in over the years. You know, uh, there's a, a lady in Australia that I I think I want to interview her again. She's she's been around for a while. Her name is Moira McGee. Uh, she's very good. Tracy and I really um, like Moira. Moira is like, she's like Australia's Linda Moulton Howe. She's the closest equivalent, I think. And she's done a lot of very good research. And she's been into this idea of human looking beings. Right. Okay. That are living among us. Yeah, she did a, um, I'm going to look in around for it. Uh, Two books? She did it in a novel form. Okay. Called. I should ask Tracy. She's wandering around. Incognito. Incognito. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. That's that's the the title. It's a it's actually it's a really good book. I don't know if it's available. Um, but anyway, the point is that I may want to bring Maura back for an interview. But um the question is, to what extent is that a true scenario? That there are human looking ETs that are quietly living among us. There's different iterations of this idea. We've all heard of David Jacobs' book called Walking Among Us. That's a different type of human-looking ET infiltration that he's describing. What Mora and, and actually some other researchers have described over many years is a little different. Uh, I think her version of it is not malev malevolent. In her assessment of it, these human looking beings that are living among us, they have nothing against us and they're just observing. If they can help here and there, they'll do it. Uh, could both scenarios be true? The evil and the good? Maybe. Could be, yeah. But I think what we really have to recognize for those of us who are, especially people who are like just diving in, to getting their foot in the water of UFOs. Yeah. Better come to the possibility that that not only is this real and not only are there non-human intelligences operating it, but they very well may have been inserting themselves somehow behind the scenes in our society for, for better or for ill. Both are possible. And in fact, both might be true. Both might be true. I, I just envision a, a very, very significant behind the scenes scenario that's probably true that we are not even beginning to try to understand how that all works. 
you know, it's, it's, it's just so such a big thing. I mean, how far does the technology go? I start to wonder, well, are there things like portals? Is that, is that true? If there's even one portal that exists on planet Earth that radically changes the entire structure of what our civilization is and of the secrecy that goes along with the subject, if even one portal is real. Can you imagine what that would mean? I mean, it just, it changes so much. So we we don't really, we have we have a long way to go in terms of understanding the true subterranean realities of this planet of ours. Yeah, and, you know, I, di I did a, um, like a short compilation video uh, called uh, Walking Among Us. And it, it's all different clips of, uh, you know, people like Robert, Robert Dean, right? Robert Dean was talking about how the Pentagon was was like devastated, scared, said, you know, they could be in, in Washington, basically. They could be anywhere, right? Bob said that? Yeah. I have to watch your video. I, I, used, I loved Bob Dean. Yeah. So that's that. in there. I included a clip from you at um, the end. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you were talking to Bryce and you brought the subject up. I, uh, I have that clip. I have, yeah. um, oh man, I'm trying. Yeah. Um, I think I have, um, Colum Kelleher in there. Colm Kelleher. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and a number and another, a number of other people, I think all together, it's like a half an hour of different compilations of all people discussing this. And, you know, I, I, obviously I can't, I can't say who, who said this, but w within that group of, um, you know, Bigelow, I was given uh, something, you know, I was told something along those lines um, in a very frightening manner, but not even just like, okay, are there ETs among us? But um, the idea that, you know, they, they wouldn't even have to be among us in like directly as them they could have a surrogate they would be able to activate or yeah utilize human mm -hmm. assets that's um, right absolutely you could hijack human beings right and, and and or you know um and the possibility you're gonna love this of i mean of like why why would why would powers that be want a surveillance state if you can identify those individuals right They're, these are like all kind of like gets into scary territory yep um so absolutely it, it's it's really so i you know even people think oh that's just ufo researcher stuff it's like there's people in very serious positions who take that very seriously um i think there's no question no question in my mind that that's true yeah so yeah. but <laughs> yeah but, thank you for sharing that actually. Yeah, yeah i you know it's it's it, it's a lot to think about right um and like how far uh, a, a secrecy group would go to keep the secret you know if you tell them that yeah they're here but not only are they here but they're walking among us you're gonna have a much different reaction right like and, and at the same time you know, and I'm not justifying secrecy, but you, if we show our hand of how much we know to the non-human intelligence, I mean, I think they it, they could read our minds, so to speak. They could foresee that anyways, but if we show our hand, uh, they'd be concerned at, with that possibility too, right? Well, some people would, would uh, quibble with your, even the way you, you phrase this, because I mean, think about it. If they're that advanced, they're that smart, they've got the ability to infiltrate. What, who are we to think that they haven't already taken full control over the levers of power on this planet? That yeah. they're not already running things. Right. I mean, realistically, if you have a highly intelligent group that is here, that is interested, by the way, not just in humanity, but Earth. We have this idea, all right. So we think, okay, there's a lot of life out there. Lots of planets have life. Okay, that's probably true. But that doesn't mean they're all equal in how amazing they are. We don't just have life. We have an enormous amount of life everywhere. We have conditions that probably are rare. We have a moon. That's important. We have a really awesome magnetosphere that protects us uh, really well. We have conditions 
that are so perfect that we've had an explosion of all kinds of life, which is really, you really think about it, probably the prime conditions necessary for the development of highly intelligent life. I mean, there are planets that probably may have a few cells scrape, scraping out a meager existence. That's life. But we, we've got like, this is paradise. How many places are true paradise like Earth? Well, maybe a few, but maybe not that many. So this place I could easily see, so highly coveted and valuable. I could easily see that. And then, of course, looking at this, these leading primates on this planet of ours, human beings, who have discovered science. We've discovered the real power of the universe. So you know, we're, of, I think, our places of supreme interest to observing intelligences right now. They may be well more advanced in certain ways, but I, there's no way in my mind that I can imagine they are not very interested in what we're doing. And in, 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 in terms of also other, like destroying our natural environment. Like we have this pristine planet with all of this life and look what we're doing. We're just wiping it all out. We are wiping out so much ecological richness and diversity. I mean, the world we inherited is this pristine, beautiful environment. And we're terraforming. We can't help it. We can't help ourselves. So we're just, you know, what did Joni Mitchell sing? Uh, pave, throw up, a, put up a park, pave something. Oh, pave paradise. Put up, put a, up parking a parking lot. lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was their song. Yeah. That's that's basically what we did. That's what we're doing. Pave paradise, put up a parking lot. So I have to th think they're looking at that thinking, this is probably not good. The nukes also not good. Um and the very, very significant aggression <laughs> that this human species has combined with their vastly greater levels of power that we as a species have attained in the last century alone compared with where you know the 1920s were just 100 years ago we were pretty sophisticated we had a lot going on in the 1920s but compared with today not even close yeah not even close so our capabilities are just through the roof they've got to be concerned they've got to be wondering and so it's is it difficult to imagine and alien species would come here thinking, all right, we we have got to get control of this. We can't do it overtly because that would wreck things. They can't, maybe they can't do an overt takeover. So we'll just do it covertly. We'll get in there, we'll manage them, we'll direct them the way we want them to go. And I, I certainly suspect that they actually are happy that we're moving toward a kind of global totalitarian system. I mean, that's really what we're doing, moving toward a global totalitarianism. And and um I could imagine that they're happy with that because that's probably what they are. You think so? Yeah, I do. I think that they're basically a hive mind type, totalitarian, centrally directed um, kind of a society. Yeah. It's my, my suspicion. Yeah. Because, because um, not because of anything inherent about them, but I think that is uh, when you start moving into highly advanced technology and science almost as a safety measure you almost can't allow that society to just go like the wild west because too much can go wrong you know if someone taps into the zero point energy field well that's awesome you can have you heat your home for free forever but you can also make probably a really good bomb and maybe blow up the pacific ocean for all i know who the hell knows so you can't you can't really allow I mean, this is just being real here. Everyone simply to just do whatever they want with that energy source, because it could be very dangerous. And that would require surveillance. That would require Big Brother basically getting in on your, into your computer, like all of these other things, because the infrastructure we've created, the, the scientific power that we have would probably demand a, um, a strong centralized dictatorial authority. 
which is really, you look around, this is what you're seeing develop around our globe. It is a central, you know, COVID really kind of made it out in the open, frankly, a, a kind of coordinated global effort to control people digitally. But I think we're simply moving along the path that I think other technologically advanced civilizations have probably gone through. I think mm-hmm. we kid ourselves when we think we have got this ability to, uh, you know, you hear Elon Musk saying, uh, well, we can pass laws to protect people's privacy in the new AI era. I mean, I'm like, I think, do you really believe what you're saying, man? <laughs> I don't think he does. I think there was just an announcement about a policy where Twitter wants um, some kind of um, identification thing. So I don't, he doesn't seem to really be thinking that. Yeah, there you go. There you go. They it, can't. Yeah. The system demands this. We The system doesn't serve us. We serve the system. Could you imagine a, 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 a development in a, in a different direction maybe than that for it for an advanced intelligence to develop you think that that's the decentralized only way? maybe right uh with some level of freedom like I like a true you... like like a true democracy right you think that's yeah. like possible amongst highly advanced mm, intelligence i could beyond... see i could see a situation where an advanced society uh is easily able to fulfill the physical needs of its people so that they're not hungry, uh, they have their needs are met. I could see that, um, and I could see a situation where. So the real question comes down to what kind of species are you talking about? It's so like in the case of the human species, we don't just have needs; we have desires. Right. So we have emotions. So what do we desire? Well, you know, you spend a couple of minutes with yourself and you kind of know what you desire. We want we want pleasure. We want to eat good food and we want pleasure. We want different kinds of pleasure. So let your mind run wild with that. And so what I could imagine is a, a society developing where a central AI or central ruling group gives those people its needs and its pleasures. And they are therefore happy in their in their existence uh a true democracy like what you're talking about well i think the the biggest equivalent i could think is where people have enough freedoms that they're happy in their in their lives freedom is a relative thing anyway right you know so uh how much freedom does someone want to be happy well that that differs with different different people so i i suspect you can have a future society where um things are organized logically they're organized well and people are given the the basic things that they need but it, there's going to be a different kind of society because like in our society we developed on the basis of people basically earning their own sovereignty especially like america you know the wild west and western expansion it's like sorry native americans but uh but we're going to move in here and we're going to create our own destiny well when you do that that's actually a really kind of a cool thing for you psychologically you develop your own will your own fortitude your own deep self respect because you accomplish difficult tasks and but is that going to be the world of the future i don't think so yeah. That's not going to happen in the future. It's going to be different. So, but but you'll have a society of very dependent, psychologically dependent people. I suspect that will have certain needs met. Uh, they'll be basically powerless against the state. The the what you're asking for can only happen if certain environmental conditions are met. That is, where people are away from centralized power and have to carve out their own life so that's probably i'm sure that's out there in the universe so that i'm sure that can happen but the question is you get to a certain level of development and how long does that last i don't i don't have the answer to that but i do think about it and i suspect that i suspect that we are moving toward a kind of digital totalitarianism that aliens who are here want because for, from their point of view, also it's better. They want they don't want two hundred separate sovereign nations to have to deal with. Hell, that's crazy. They want it's just like 
you're dealing in, you know, you're a purchasing agent for a corporation. Do you really want to deal with like 15 different companies to buy your goods? No, you want one 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 guy <laughs> that you develop your relationship with who can organize it because it's simpler. It's I think that's universal. So I think they want one society for them to deal with and for them to manipulate to get their hooks into. And that's much that's much better for them. So I think a global, centralized, digitally controlled world, A, probably they see as natural and B is, is definitely preferable. It allows better control. That that's just my suspicion. Do you think do you think that there are others that have um I don't want to say our best interest, but uh, a good interest for yeah, for well, us, I think yeah. these aliens probably think that this is our best interest. Right. They probably think oh, these humans are too stupid to have all this freedom. Too much freedom. They need to be controlled. They they could very well be thinking that's what's best for humanity. But what you're saying, I, if I may interpret you, is are there entities out there that want humans to remain free and uh, to kind of develop ourselves and self-actualize and that type of thing? And I guess I could say maybe, but I don't. I don't know. And how that actually happens is uh, in the kind of world that we're creating. Well, I don't know if my uh, ma imagination of the future is sufficient to grasp <laughs> right. that one yet. Right. I'd like to. I mean, I do think about it. Yeah. But I'm not sure if I have that one. Yeah. I mean, even just what you're saying, even even if it's um, within our interests. Um, so we don't destroy ourselves, right? If because be, and and because of their influence, right? Is that a, is that a good or a bad thing, right? Yeah. Like what? What do you? Even, that's a tough one. I mean, like um, the whole idea of freedom, which we, you and I, we grew up with this. We were, you know, fed the idea of freedom from our earliest childhood. I mean, we believe in it. I believe in it. But you look at it historically, that whole idea of freedom and individualism is a new idea among humans. It's a fairly new idea. And it coincides with the scientific and industrial revolution for a reason. Because to create this new infrastructure that gave gives our society so much power, science and industry, it was understood that you really need to allow much more freedom than had ever been allowed before. Because you need a lot of smart people to come up with really great ideas. And they're only gonna be able to do that if they actually have some level of intellectual freedom. And that can only come with, you have to allow a certain level of political freedom. Like all of this happened over a period of generations, but it was inexorable. And so we developed a culture of freedom because we realized, oh wow, it can give us much greater power as a society, which it did. But now the question is, is that still the case today in the 21st century when intellectual labor is now going to be able to be done by algorithms increasingly, artificial intelligent algorithms, uh, and in which human beings are becoming a little bit less maybe necessary to the functioning of a global infrastructure with algorithms and automated machinery and robots and so forth. Are, we're becoming a little superfluous and not as necessary. And therefore the kind of intellectual freedom that was necessary to create all of this society, maybe that's not quite as necessary. And I suspect that's we've been seeing a, a diminution of intellectual freedom for that very reason, because it's the infrastructure we have created no longer demands it to the same extent. And again, I think this may be a, a path that aliens, civilizations have gone through as well. Right, right. I um, just think it's possible. I mean, look, I'm just spitballing here. But the fact is, there is no one else in the UFO community who's even remotely asking these types of questions. So I don't really have anyone else to bounce these ideas off of. So I'm just, <laughs> I sit by myself and I think about this and I'm like, could this be true? I don't know. Could that be true? I mean, there's just no conversation about this anywhere. So I'm basically in a situation where I'm talking to myself about this 99% of the time. 
And then yeah. I get to be on a program like this with you and I get to <laughs> flat it out there for the world. Yeah. So. Well, and, and maybe it'll plant some seeds and people will start thinking about it and discussing it. Um, I, right. I, I know you have to go soon, but I, I did want to bring up uh, as brief as we can uh, Zodiac, you know, because yeah. in the revelation of, of David Grush's testimony, uh, you know, crash retrievals, bodies, um, disinformation, um, him saying that he had reported to the inspector, uh, the intelligence community inspector general program names, um, you know, something that comes to mind is Zodiac, right? So yeah. um, in, you know, just a brief kind of rehash of, you know, what is Zodiac? Yeah, yeah. I'm really glad you brought this up. Uh, this is something that I raised a couple of years ago. And I think you're like one of the only people to pick up on this and really stay with it. So Zodiac uh, very likely is a, a different and maybe more accurate name for what we might and, have called MJ-12. Yeah. So a, a kind of a UFO or less now UAP uh, control group might be one way to look at it. Uh, the, the name Zodiac came out, as far as I know, for the first time in <laughs> a few issues over 20 years ago in UFO magazine. Uh, back in the very late '90s, you know, I can uh, I can give you a link for that. I have a free link to my website for that whole PDF. Yeah, and I can give it to you, and you can people can just download it. It's really good reading. It's three episodes of UFO Mag from I think 1998, 1998, and um, it's fictionalized, but it's very thinly veiled fictionalized, and so it's uh. In a series of articles written by a man named Jeffrey Griffith, who used a, uh, a pseudonym. Pseudonym was Greg Halifax, but it's Jeffrey Griffith, uh, who I think is alive. He is, and I, tr yeah. me and others have tried to contact him. Yeah, I know a, a journalist who tried to contact him too, and it was dead end. Yeah, no, he doesn't want to talk to anyone. But Griffith is mentioned, of course, in the Davis Wilson notes. That's a key thing. And where Zodiac mentioned. Yeah, at the on the last page, right? In the yeah, the alien autopsy. Well, in the alien autopsy the, email thread. Yeah. yeah, not in Davis Wilson. But 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 it was it was in the collection of Edgar Mitchell's files. Correct. That's correct. So Edgar Mitchell, who is part of the National Institute for Discovery Science, he's on the on the board there, knew all the same people, knew Davis, knew Putoff, knew Kid Green, knew Colm Kelleher. Um, and of course, uh, knew Stephen Greer and uh, Will Miller and all the people who spoke to Thomas Wilson, knew Thomas Wilson. Mitchell is very perfectly placed to know a lot of this. And when he died, his papers came out. And yeah, his, the Davis notes came out. And also this email thread that he had in, uh, I think it was 2001, with Putoff and Davis and Kit Green was in there and right. Palm Keller was in there. And they're first of all, they're talking about the the Ray Santilli alien autopsy video, which that was interesting. The whole question is, you know, uh Kit Green is in the thread saying, Yeah, that video looks exactly like what I was briefed on years before. And yeah, I think I think that's what's so crazy is that people hadn't talked about that. I mean, in that email chain, yeah. Kit Green is saying that he was brought to the Pentagon several times yeah. and briefed on That's Italian right. bodies. Back in 87, 88, and then uh, in the early 90s. Like, how is that not, like, crazy important? It is super important. Well, of course, now I interviewed Kit in the aftermath of that. And, uh, you know, I was never allowed to publish the full unadorned transcript, but I did write a very detailed article about my interview and that is that's publicly available um i can give you a link for that if people want to read it but i don't to this day i mean i don't really know what kit's total what his actual position on that is right. he has said publicly and i'll just out of respect to him and i have a lot of respect for him he has said he no longer believes that he was legitimately briefed and being shown images of actual aliens. He he believes 
or at least that's what he said to me, that he was subjected to a kind of op, a disinformation, basically a test. Yeah. Um, and and one of the reasons he believes that is that he he said, like, I, I was never actually brought into such a program. I always thought that this would lead to me being brought into the program, but I never was. And so he concludes, he says that, that what he was shown was not true, but be that as it may. So if that is the case in 2000, 2001, though, he still believed that it was legit. So here he is on this email thread telling Davis and put off and the rest. I think Alexander was part of that thread briefly too, John Alexander saying, oh yeah, that, that stuff is real. <laughs> That's a hundred percent real. And Davis in the thread, you could say is like skeptical or like incredulous, like really? You serious? Because that looks like BS to me. So that whole, that's an interesting conversation. And at the very end of that email thread, it's many pages, Hal Puthoff writes to Green. And he's, uh, well, and to the other guys in the thread, and he's like, hey, what do you all think about this thing called Zodiac? This is... uh, in the recent UFO magazine. He said, I think it was written by someone named Sedge Masters, the Sedge Masters articles. Actually, yeah. I don't know. Did he mention Zodiac by name in that thread? He did. Might know. Yeah, I thought he, he did. did. He says it was the articles by a Sedge Masters. Yeah. And uh, real, uh, he real got it quick, mostly before, right. Before I forget, I just want to highlight that, you know, you know, Zodiac and, and this very same regard and instance was brought up in Jacques Vallée's volume five. Yes. Very good point. Yes. Good to know. So like this has been discussed by the crowd, the Bigelow crowd, sometimes as I call them. Um, so and in the email thread, Puthoff basically said, we have good reason to think that this is a this is more than just fictionalized truth. So he's talking about the UFO man. He's talking about the whole Zodiac thing. So, um, yes, indeed. Because we know that in the Davis Wilson notes. Davis mentions to Wilson, he brings up uh, Mary Elizabeth Elliot and right. Jeffrey Griffith. Right. They're all part of this whole thing. And Griffith and Mary Elliot, I am quite convinced, were witnesses to a USO incident off uh, Rancho Palos Verdes in California of an object apparently coming right out of the water, flying over their car. And probably both of them driving up after it and running. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole adventure that's written about in the Sedge Masters Zodiac article in the UFO magazine. So Putoff and Green and Davis, they they all knew about this somehow. And they were very interested in this story. And somehow Griffith and Mary Elizabeth Elliot learned about the existence of this program called Zodiac. That's what I think happened. And and the NIDS group got wind of it and they became very, very interested in this. So anyway, Zodiac is simply, in this rendition, a different name for MJ-12. But think about what Zodiac is. There's 12 houses in the Zodiac. It's 12. MJ-12. So there's a, a definite kind of connection there uh in terms of meaning i think zodiac very well may be the other name uh definitely some of that the the nids and the ttsa group today uh you ask them about zodiac and you you're going to get a knowing reply they may not say anything about it but they know they know about zodiac so that may be the real name for mj12 a UFO control group. I, I suspect it is the real name for it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a very, you know, again, you got to get me the, that link to your website. So everybody oh, yeah. can read the, the PDF for themselves. Cause again, the whole story is about an intelligence officer who's interrogating people uh, that were part of a crash retrieval team. And, yeah. um, and, and it goes on from there. Uh, it's fictionalized, but it's sophisticated. Like right. You read it and you like this is this is really well thought out. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um yeah, there's 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 somebody that we both know that 
that has claimed to me and that, you know, I would consider a very, very, very credible source that has a firsthand source to that story firsthand. So somebody, you know, involved with it, but they said it's complicated and they will only talk about it with me in person. I think I know who you mean. Yeah. So that's something that I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah, we're in a, it's a hall of mirrors and a labyrinth of various types. And, uh, you know, to take it back to what we were talking about, members of Congress and trying to get at this truth, it's a very difficult thing to do because you're dealing with the formal legal system, which Congress is part of that. But then you're dealing with, you know, you, like you look at Davis's notes with Wilson and you can very clearly see you've got these special access programs nested within fairly obscure places within the Pentagon, and also certainly, let's say CIA, and let's also certainly say DOE, uh, they all, I, I'm sure that all three of those have similar types of programs, which are very, very difficult, if not impossible, for ordinary people to get access to. And where, you know, to some extent, private contractors have powerful sway, if not maybe dominant sway, over them. And so getting to that, that's not an easy task. You know, I mean, we've heard the story. Bill Clinton, 30 years ago, comes into the White House, talks to his buddy, Webster Hubble, you know, out of Arkansas and says, I want you to find out two things for me. Who killed JFK and are UFOs real? Everyone knows the story. Hubble wrote about it. I don't know how hard Hubble really looked, but he got stonewalled quickly on and got nowhere with that. So it's this is not an easy thing uh, to get at. I think this is a very difficult thing to get at. Right. I, yeah. And I, I, you know, it's that period is very notable because you had the Rockefeller Initiative. You know, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer was doing all the stuff that he was doing. Dr. Edgar Mitchell was involved. You know, Thomas Wilson, uh, Patrick Hughes, right, who was the director of the DIA. Wilson's who, superior at that time. Yeah. Right who had a serious conversation um, with, you know, the disclosure project at that time. And, uh, and again, so who's around for that time period, right. Is Podesta. So mm -hmm. he, his, he kept his interest and probably had built his network back then. And here we see him back with TTSA and Tom and the WikiLeaks and McCaslin and, um, yeah. Weiss, the, the the CEO or the number one guy at Lockheed. Robert, Robert Weiss over at Lockheed, right. Yeah. And so we yeah. see all these things that have been brewing under the surface finally coming out over you know 30 years, right? That this has all been in motion and these groups and networks and factions have been pushing for different levels of transparency. So it's yeah. like a, a coming, you know, it's a coming to, it's like a, you know, a full circle almost. I'm really glad you mentioned that. That, that ties it together really well, or at least better than we'd done before. So that's good that you mentioned that. Yeah, Podesta, he's he's another piece of this puzzle. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, there's there were people around during that time that are, they, they've been pushing this whole time uh, to try to get some level of transparency. Um, yeah, I know, I know you have to go rich, but I did want to ask you, you have a new book coming out, right? Working it's, on it. Working on it. So what is that uh, book? I'm working. It's the most exciting project I've done in, in years. It's on USOs. It's uh, unidentified submersible objects. And um, there's a lot done right now. Uh, I think it's approaching probably between 350 and 400 pages right now. That's without illustrations. It will be illustrated. And I still have more text to write. But there's a lot that's done. So, uh, so I'm happy <laughs> about that. Um, what I find is that I've, I've gone through of lots of different sources that have collected these stories. Um, and I've just, I've, I have to go through them one at a time and decide like, is this, is this a strong case? Is this a weak case? Do I want this? Um, and I will just say, uh, I, it is necessary to give recognition to the late Carl Feint. Carl, um, I think died uh, three, four years ago. He was by far the, the most, proficient researcher on the relationship of UFOs and water. He wrote a book on that very subject. It's a very good book. And he had a website, which is 
officially there, but the links are all dead. You can't can't get to it. Where he collected a lot of these USO and and other cases where UFOs are interacting with water, not necessarily as USOs. He did an, a huge amount of just gathering these things together, and so he deserves a major shout out. But for my part, I'm just taking all of these cases and um, just writing them out and and giving them a treatment that I think they deserve. We need, we desperately need, because we don't have a single source that collects pretty much all of the, not all, but as many of the good USO cases that we can collect. And there's so many of them. I'm just, I'm kind of blown away by how many there are. Just, just so people have something to wrap their head around. Can you, can you list off like two or three good cases? You don't have to go into them. Just. Yeah. 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 Uh, I just, let me pull up. I've got a couple that are, I think are right in front of me. Uh, let's just see here. <laughs> I should have had them more in front of me, but let me just look at my, I have another window here. Are you going to include the, the Nimitz in that, in that book? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's the 2004 Nimitz case. You have to. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just too good. Oh, this one, I don't even have my notes here. I just have maps. Um, well, I'll just say uh, a lot of them are military cases, so and a lot of them are not military cases. Most are not military cases. Uh, you start getting really good USO cases in the 19th century, believe it or not. So like okay. in the early 1800s, you start getting some really good ones. I found one from 1825 off the coast of Hawaii in the, in the Pacific Ocean with a British ship, because the, the, the English were everywhere over the world at that time. Uh, one of these two, three in the morning cases where this naturalist is on board the ship. His name was Andrew Bloxham, B-L-O-X-A-M. He writes in his journal. He said at 3 a.m., everyone was woken up by this commotion. He said the the night watch was on the ship and they said it became brighter than daytime, three in the morning. Uh, where this glowing orange object had come out of the water, yeah, lit up the deck. He said it was so bright, you you literally could pick a pin off the floor of the deck. He said it went back into the water and then came up a second time, and then descended. The hell is that? I mean, <laughs> I, I you read that and you think, okay. There's zero reason to lie about this. Like nothing. This was a highly intelligent, logical young scientist who just writes this in his journal in 1825. It's like if anyone's seen the movie Master and Commander, it's basically that era, essentially, a little bit later. Um, wooden ships with sails, you know, middle of the night is pitch black and it becomes bright. There's just not a good explanation for that. And I mention that because. There was an almost identical situation in, uh, I think in the 1950s with the USS Roosevelt, U.S. Naval Aircraft Carrier, where I've got that one, uh, where, again, a glowing orange globe uh, essentially shuts down all of the electronic functioning of that ship. Is a U.S. nuclear armed aircraft carrier, and it's disabled right. for a good right. thirty minutes or more. Wow. Yeah, in the ocean with this glowing orange thing, and this is described with a lot of these Navy cases. You get they're not you don't get them from Freedom of Information. Like it's, you're not going to get that. Uh, the way that we get these cases, almost every single time, some Navy guy twenty years, thirty years after the fact writes anonymously, nearly always, to some blog or some researcher that he gets to know and he tells a story. Yeah. And you and know what's what's interesting about that too is again, nowadays uh, people, there's so much information flowing. But if you go back into the original uh, disclosure project witness testimony, there are several uh, Navy incidents that are discussed. Right yes. in this book. Yeah. This is it. And all, but there, there right. was also the uh, the inter they did like a long form. It wasn't a documentary, but they took like five minutes from maybe like fifty people, and it's it's in a like a three hour. It was a DVD, but you can find it now on the internet somewhere. Um, and and then they also yeah, those are great videos. 
they, uh, I, people I hope need they to revisit that it, because again, there's I, I can think of two major Navy incidents that were discussed in length. I was uh, just that's why I have this book here because I was just reviewing one of those. This is, I think this is the best thing Stephen Gray ever did, in my opinion, was this book and that project. And the witness and testimony. Interview. Yeah. You know, how, uh, I think that's so valuable. funny. The, I, yeah, you know, this is just like a sunny, a funny side note is that, you know, Greer has spoken out against TTSA and it's an op and all this. But the funny thing about it is like some of the, you know, how put off was the disclosure project witness, right? You know, so I mean, exactly. it's like, ah, it is, you know, it's, it's just people being people. I get it, you know, and, and I, think I don't want to hundred percent wrong on the things that he says on this, on this matter. Right. And some things, uh, yeah. I'm not think... talking about it being a false flag. Uh, I think he abuses the, fr- the the concept of false flag for it to I, fit his I, uh, ideas. I Yeah. I mean, that, that's a whole discussion within itself. I, I yeah. we, we'll, we can save that for another time, but there's a, there's sure. interesting elements to that because I, I, I do think um, he is paranoid and then maybe he, he has reason to be. I don't know. Maybe he was, uh, you know, a target for oh, disinformation. Yeah. Right. He was like, I would not dispute that at all. So, but um, this, this uh, book, this closure book, this is, uh, honestly, it's an outstanding collection. It's one of the most important UFO books I can think of. It's right uh, yeah. out there with, uh, any, any of the other best ones. Yeah. Um, but Rich, I, yeah, you know, I could I could sit here and talk for another ten hours easily about all this. I stuff. enjoy it. Yeah, it's good. I gotta have you back on another time. There's there's stuff on here that I didn't even get to, um, but we we will definitely uh, speak again soon. Do you have Do you have any other um, uh, parting words to the audience, or where, or you know, uh, parts of your work that people should be aware of, or anything you have coming out, or uh, yeah. they should look into. I think um, I think we should just remind ourselves that we human beings have a right to know what is true about the world we live in. We are in an era where we've landed on Mars, we've gone to the moon. We are we have achieved so many unbelievable things in terms of science, and yet on this matter of advanced intelligences that have clearly been visiting and coming to this world and living here, we are kept in the dark. We can do better. We deserve better, not simply out of idle curiosity, but because this is our place in the universe and we do have a right to know what is going on around us. We do have a right to know this and we should not ever give up on that idea that this is our right. And and we want to be responsible about that. We obviously, but we we have the right to know what is going on in this world around us. We should not lose sight of that. For sure. And uh where can people find your work? Um, well, I got my YouTube channel, which is Richard Olin Intelligent Disclosure. My main website is richardolinmembers.com. Uh, there's paywall stuff there, but there's a lot of free content there. People can just go check out a lot of the, the things that I create. I Most of the work that I do ends up on that website. Uh, so I would say that's a good place to find me. I've got a bunch of books. You could find them on richardolanpress.com. Um, and that's basically what I do. There's a Twitter feed and there's, uh, you know, whatever else is there's Someone right. runs an Instagram thing for me, so. Yeah, I was saying before, everybody, everybody watching this needs to go back and, and read UFOs in the national security state. I mean, that's how I became familiar with you, Rich. I think I saw um I saw you on like a Project Camelot conference, uh, mm-hmm. and you were on Paracast and um Oh yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. the old days. That's the right. old days. You know, that's oh six, oh seven, those years. There was you, uh, you didn't, you there didn't will have... be a third volume of UFOs National Security State. There will be a third volume of that. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, you know, again, it's always great speaking with you, Rich. Thanks so much. Uh totally my pleasure. I enjoyed it tremendously, James. So thank you for having me on. All right. Take care, Rich. You too.